Thank you. Thank you. Uh, believe. To be human is to believe. We must believe. Beliefs are what allow us to uh, know who we are, to know the world, to know ourselves, and what uh, allow us to understand meaning and purpose. Without beliefs, we couldn't move into the known, into the darkness. Sooner than later, however, we connect this belief to something transcendental, as the great uh, philosopher, American philosopher William James uh, said, the invisible order of things. This is a metaphysical realm, a force or being that is beyond humanity and again provides us with purpose and meaning. Most, if not all religions, tell us that if we could align with this invisible order of things, a lot of things, good things will happen. Wisdom, everlasting life, peace, nirvana, enlightenment. And religions provide us with ways in which we could provide, you know, get to this alignment, teachings and practices. Despite all we hear about the death of religion, the reality actually is the opposite. Uh, this is a recent Gallup poll, International, on atheism and religiosity that shows that 62% um, of people in the world consider themselves religious, and only about 25% consider themselves not necessarily non-religious, but not associated with a particular religion, however very spiritual and uh, believed in transcendence, for instance. About 10% uh, to 13% is only uh, atheists. And if you look at the trends towards the future, uh, religious uh, people will con 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 uh, continue to be the majority of people on this planet. If you look at our country, America is the most religious uh, country on the industrialized and developed world. Uh, except for the three uh, states on the Northeast, the, all the rest of the states have very, very large number of people that consider themselves religious. Yet, yet, despite all this religiosity, all this great uh, belief in something transcendental, our actions are far from holy or sacred. Uh, we see uh, the results of these actions. Uh, climate change, global warming, pollution, refugees, terrorism, armed races, perhaps war, and perhaps underline all this greed that moves the world. Not just the world, but our own country has its own challenges. Violence, racism, poverty and homelessness, access to health care, shootings, and of course the list could go on and on. Some could say that the beliefs are the problems. Beliefs are the problems. But I would propose to you that's not the case. If you look throughout history and what our great teachers, spiritual teachers, uh, told us, that's not the case. You know, all religions, all the great books, all the great teachers tell us to be sincere and honest, to help one another and love one another not to uh, indulge in selfish uh, acts and respect life and be just and so on and so forth. In fact, all religions say that if we act likewise, like supposedly the God or the divine uh, being of those religions um, um, foster, we are going to receive great uh, reward, heaven, uh, enlightenment, and, and so on and so forth. So I will propose, at least for today, that the problem is not our belief, but the fact that we do not enact these beliefs. We do not practice what we preach. We do not uh, practice what we uh, profess. Now, why so? But something seems to be missing in translation when we go from this realm of transcendence into the realm of ordinary life. You see, when we go to the um, daily life we cannot somehow apply these beliefs. We forget them or we consider them they're not um, good enough or, 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 or we forget them. Why so? 
Well, if there is something all religions do agree on, is that our human nature is far from perfect, or strong, or pure, or enlightened enough to be able to apply these beliefs. And this is not true, not only true individually, but when we go collectively, the effects are even uh, more and more problematic. As a result, you know, we, when we act, we don't act uh, in accordance to these beliefs in heart or mind, but rather we act for a selfish, ethnocentric, tribal, ideological, economic, or whatever other reason. And for this very reason, because we fail to do these things, all religions have provided us with practices and values and behaviors that if we could practice them, uh, we would perhaps align ourselves with this invisible order of things. Very much like a tree that needs uh, staking and care to grow healthy and straight, these practices are supposed to help us to grow spiritually in the right path. Three of these practices maybe need to be considered. Um, and these practices are common to the three Abrahamic traditions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And they are charity, um, prayer, and fasting. Uh, prayer is perhaps the most direct communication with God or the reception uh, or the listening to God through a variety of practices from vocal prayer to meditation to contemplation. Charity, on the other hand, is uh, exercising and developing of our love and compassion and empathy for other fellow human beings and perhaps even go as far as give of our time, our effort, even our possession for the less, less uh, lucky. In some faith, this is the most direct way to God. And finally, fasting should be understood not just not eating this or that, but actually it's an, a voluntary uh, act of restraint not to engage in necessarily productive or consumption that is, that's not um, direct us to something that is divine within ourselves. Notice that all these three practices have something in common. They uh, direct us to first devote time and discipline and effort, in other words, some level of sacrifice. And all of them require us that we forget ourselves for the sake of something larger or more important. God, other beings, not necessarily humans, sometimes uh, nature, uh, and even our own self, but it's our divine side of ourselves. So our egotistic drives, our selfish uh, impulses should be put aside so we could actually um, get to this level. And we'll return to the, the fact that the self needs to be forgotten in order for us to align to this transcendental order of things. Now, we also know that practicing these three or any other spiritual practice is very hard. Our 21st century is full of uh, stressful demands from us and hardly give us any time or um, support for engaging these practices. And therefore, most of us only spend maybe once a week, one or two hours in our temple, praying or doing any act of worship. Perhaps once or twice a year, we engage in some sort of charity action, donating our time for a particular cause, and hardly we get any fasting. This is a problem for all of us. I mean, how are we gonna evolve, develop spiritually when we put no time? It's like asking a skier or a basketball player to be a, even a mediocre one, practicing once a week for a couple hours. It's it be just a ridiculous proposition. Because we don't practice these uh, different exercises on spirituality, we basically fall back into our ordinary behavior, uh, our, if you want, selfish or sinful or unenlightened ways, which are supported by our consumerist society, as we all know, and we get the world that we get. Clearly, we need some help. We need help into extending this practice into other areas that are not just necessarily located within sacred spaces. And should be a help that is easy, accessible, and also require as little effort from us. Let's be real about this. Less effort, better. And I will propose today that perhaps the built environment, architecture, the city, can help us in this endeavor. Physical form and spaces not only can uh, symbolize and express our desire to connect 
and, and, and um, celebrate transcendence, but may more importantly, may, may nudge us into alignment with such force. This is a good example here, you could see, is the um, Salk uh, Institute uh, outside San Diego, a work by uh, architect Louis Kahn, and built by a Salk, uh, Jonah Salk, the person that uh, discovered the polio vaccine. This is a place where, uh, it's a secular place where our, uh, research uh, in biology is uh, performs. And this is a beautiful courtyard where people meet and share their ideas and face the Pacific Ocean and the in, in, infinite horizon. At the end of this beautiful water path is basically eternity. Once, uh, twice a year in equinox, the sun sets at the end of this uh, water feature. Um, this is no question, it's a contemplative space that uh, the lucky people that can visit uh, have a chance to connect with something transcendental. Architecture here helps in a way that is completely effortless. Now, uh, the built environment is so good for many reasons. One is that we spend about 90% of our time inside constructed or artificial environments, very much like this. We are continuously within environments that we humans have created, and therefore it affects us whether we like it or not at a very unconscious level. Any change, any quality of this will be creating an atmosphere within which we, we operate. Second, as we all know, we have become an urban civilization. More than 50% of humanity live in cities, and this number will just increase proportionally as we go into the 21st century. In fact, between now and 2050, which is only 33 years in the future, we're going to add two Chinas to the world population, about 2.5, 2.6 billion people. You just imagine that, which is very hard to imagine. The amount of building we had to do in addition to keep up our built environment is tremendous. If we want to be able to deploy our beliefs, if we want to be able to grow spiritually, I would submit to you that the built environment is a good place to at least consider. Now, of course, there is nothing new in claiming that buildings and architecture can affect and help us spiritually. I mean, history, uh, the history of humankind is replete with great temples and synagogues and mosques and churches where this really happens, monasteries. What's perhaps uh, a little bit different this time, what I'm proposing to you, is that uh, we should actually think of this differently. Perhaps we should export, if you wish, this, this uh, practice is from the realm of um, sacred space into the secular realm of the city. Move away from sacred space into the realm of the profane. This is a topic of hot topic in many quarters. Here you see a series of uh, uh, books that have been published in the few last years dealing with this from anthropology, theology, spirituality, psychology, very interesting uh, topic. However, when you go from these scholars to mainstream uh, academy, mainstream professionals, mainstream marketplace, this idea of using the built environment to advance spiritual causes is forgotten or frankly avoided altogether. And you could see why. I mean, it's a very, very heavy, politically dangerous uh, uh, situation. Um, you know, you don't want to touch these, these topics. And yet, we do need to talk about this. This is the ground from which all the ethical and attitude towards the world needs to be, needs to be uh, founded. But maybe one of the biggest problems is that we apparently don't have enough data to support the claim that the built environment can actually do anything. It's just subjective, is it just belief, it's just faith, or do we have any actual information that actually can support the claim that architecture or the built environment can help us to move forward spiritually. Until very recently, this was very hard to prove. However, over the last 20 years, and particularly the last 10, uh, through the advances in neuroscience, and in particularly brain imaging, now we could speak into the architectural brain and see if some of the claims that people make about the impact of architecture are true or not. Here you see nine papers, there are many more, over the, published in respected journals over the last five, six years, uh, dealing with this very much. And this field of neuroaesthetics is very hot. Um, uh, that covers not just architecture, but covers the arts, 
uh, both visual and, and performing arts. And you see some example here of being used to explore, for instance, the, 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 the experience of uh, uh, awe, or for instance, how sacred music can directly uh, have an impact on moral behavior. Uh, or how houses of worship can actually restore us cognitively and emotionally. This is data now that we could put on the table. It's just not subjective call. Really, there is data. And I want to pay attention to one such study, which is uh, work that I've done with a, a group of scientists um, that investigated whether architecture designed for contemplation can actually produce experiences that are contemplative. To do that, we compare ordinary architectures, building for any particular, uh, any, any, any normal uh, uh, program, an architecture that was, you know, dedicated to, 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 to develop this meditative state. Um, what we found is that architecture that produces contemplation drops significantly the level of anxiety and mind wandering. These are signature of contemplation, by the way. And also that the experience that these subjects um, uh, reported were of a produce an outcome and have a character and the level of attention was such that again, um, very clearly could be defined as contemplative. When we look at the actual um, fMRI data, data uh, the neuro, uh, neurological data, we see that there is a total correlation between what the subject said was happening to them experientially and their uh, brain signature. Here we saw, for instance, that all the parts of the brain relating to absorption with the external world, namely, you know, the, the occipital lobe dealing with vision, with the prefront, the, the precental cortex dealing with the motor activity, parietal lobes dealing with uh, sensory integration were all turned on, as was the insula and the limbic systems. These are places associated with pleasure and aesthetic responses. Perhaps the most powerful uh, or most convincing evidence of our uh, investigation was the fact that the deeper the contemplative states these subjects uh, had uh, during the experiment, the lesser the activation of massive areas of the brain. So apparently the brain shut down the deeper their contemplative experience. And the areas that were shut down, remarkably enough, are the areas dealing with the self and ego, which we saw before are necessary to connect to something uh, transcendental, namely the prefrontal cortex, the, the locus of uh, conscious thinking, executive function, criticism, analysis, all what we say there, the, the, the place where we are, our ego operates from. And also areas related to what is called the default mode network, which is a, a network of area of the brain that actually we depend on to do our daily waking uh, life. Now, this uh, downregulation of the prefrontal cortex, along with an upregulation of all the part of the brain that deal with the external world, find also some correlation uh, with other uh, uh, neuroscience research that have been happening and lends further support to my claim that the built environment can actually produce effects that connect us to something uh, larger, the invisible order, order of things. One such case is, is uh, the investigation on psychology, on flow experiences or peak states. These are states that people arrive under um, peak performances like uh, athletes, uh, athletes and um, artists, like you know, violinists, for instance. In these cases, all the power of the brain is placed on the activities that demands the performance. And therefore, the parts of the brain that do not help on that are shut down. In this case, again, is the prefrontal cortex. These uh, flow experiences are said to have profound mystical qualities of not just pleasure, but a connection to something larger and transcendent. Another example of this is uh, the neuroscience investigation of yoga, yoga practice and uh, deity visualization in Buddhism. Now, Two other conditions are important to mention. One is uh, the investigation of neuroscience, again, on alternative states of consciousness, particularly those in psychedelic, using psychedelic drugs, which uh, shows some of the similar conditions. Part of the brain usually utilized 
for uh, ordinary you know, life are shut down and completely new networks opened. And the same is similar when uh, neuroscientists look at uh, profound experiences of, as, of ascetic kind, kind and um, mystical states. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there is a, a growing amount of evidence based on data, not just individual or subjective statement or based on faith, that indicate that the external world can actually be a great help in assisting us to enter in alignment with this transcendental force, however you want to define it. The question, of course, that we now have at hand, if architecture could produce such contemplative responses, could it also help us to um, assist us into uh, produce responses that go towards charity and fasting? And since we really need this help 24-7, um, I would say, to grow spiritually, can we actually export some of these uh, practices from the realm of the sacred into the secular, as I said before? Can we um, perhaps develop a spiritual city by moving these practices from the, the, the sacred into, into the profane? I think we should consider at least the possibility of this. It's too much at stake not to actually consider the, 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 the potential of this. Now, there are two caveats, and they're very important caveats. One, I'm not talking here of creating a city full of sacred and religious spaces, you know, that, that you know, is, is, is Muslim or, or Christian or Buddhist. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about of using some of the teachings um, of these practices to uh, ex uh, export them into uh, otherwise just ordinary buildings. And I will show some examples of that. And the second, which is a very important as well, is that we all acknowledge that we live in, in complex societies that are very diverse. So no one religion should have power over the other. So when we're talking about these spiritual practices, should be in a, in a way that have a common ground of of uh, agreement on what this practice ought to be. So a Jew and a Buddhist or a Hindu could agree with this contemplative attitude a state is. And this is not easy necessarily to, uh, to agree on, but it's not impossible. And I will just put forward here a, a hypothesis which I am working on. For instance, when we look about prayer, what we look, we'll be looking for an architectural or built environment perspective, will be environments that assist us into alignment or contemplation of this invisible order of things. This will be uh, places that foster silence, foster a uh, slowdown in our ordinary, you know, quick uh, lifestyle, and produce places that uh, are secure and peaceful. Um, for in the case of charity, we're looking at places that foster connection so that we begin to know one another um, in ways that, that allow us to develop empathy. Some people call the urban love effect. Uh, so then we can begin to consider giving. We consider about, uh, begin to understand social justice, unity, and um, even nature could be part of this, this uh, phenomenon. And lastly, fasting, we'll be looking at places that actually um, invite to abstain from doing, abstain from consumption, so we can resensitize ourselves to the gift of being alive and not necessarily having to do something or, or have something. So it will be a, a movement towards simplicity, that is voluntary, of course, and to authenticity and well-being. So if the question that we pose ourselves is, you know, how can buildings um, and the city help us honor and uh, um, practice our beliefs, find transcendence, and evolve spiritually, perhaps the answer could be this one. That be brings, begins to bring it down to the, the concrete uh, possibility of doing that through architectural means. And I will show now five examples on, in how this could be accomplished architecturally in the secular space. So it's not religious or sacred spaces. We start with this um, parking garage. I mean, you, you, it's hard to believe that you can find any sacredness in any parking garage, but here you have it. <laughs> here you have it. This is in Cadiz, Spain, um, by architect Alberto Campo Baeza, one of my favorite architects. Um, now, if you, you see the, the, the garage, if you take the ramp on the left and you walk up, into the platform and turn around, 
suddenly you have the Atlantic Ocean for you. Suddenly you are lifted up from the ordinary noise and, and busyness of that um, a street, and you are catapulted in a state of solitude, uh, definitely more silent than the street. Uh, notice also the, the level of reduction, if you wish, of tension of the architectural language that removes all noise and focusing what matters, which is a connection or alignment, better said, to this uh, invisible order of things. It's hard to believe that you will not find something uh, transcendent. Imagine, this is open to any citizen of that al Qadis that can go there every day and pray, really. And it, did, it, did, it didn't matter if you're Christian or, or Muslim. Another example is the inner city arts uh, project in outside Los Angeles. This is just out, uh, downtown, uh, designed by Michael Maltzan. Uh, this is uh, in a part of town that you could see here in the slide, quite uh, run down, and it's open to any, any uh, person that was, walk, w wants to walk in, although it serves 10,000 uh, at-risk kids of the uh, LA public school system. Um, here, uh, this beautiful building, not just honor the, and dignify the most, uh, the weakest, and uh, most at-risk member of uh, society, and provide them with an education, the foundation really of spiritual growth, particularly through the arts. But in the very act of giving, this altruistic, this charity act, by itself, this community as a large grows spiritually as well. It's very hard to believe that uh, a society could grow spiritually when member of its own kind are homeless or live in slums. Um, here you have an example of Chile, far away from here, but nonetheless too part of this planet, by Alejandro Aravena, famous architect, just received the uh, Prisker Prize a couple years ago. Um, this is a place that uses a very reduced vocabulary, partially because of budget, of course, social housing, but also allows the members of the, that community that is taken from the slum or homelessness and allows them to grow and express themselves and personify their own dwelling and develop their community. The ground for spiritual growth are, are grounded, are founded in the weakest member of society, not necessarily the, 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 the most, the richest one. Um, another example which is quite common in the US and I think, uh, and it's a beautiful example is um, libraries, public libraries. Here we have the Salt Lake City Public Library that is very popular with the media as you can see in channel two. Um, it has been embraced by all members of uh, Salt Lake City um, that use this place not just to get wisdom and, and, and information and knowledge which yet is another part of growing a, a community spiritually but maybe more important for everyday life just hanging out, connecting with people, the people that, that they don't know each other. Uh, the ground of urban love is seated there. Festivals are carried on. People chose, choose this place for um, their most important event in life. But also homeless are given continuous support. Uh, for instance, here you hear on the left, on the left you see um, homeless people doing Tai Chi. And this happened every day in that place. Bringing nature back into our cities, especially rundown city of town, or the destruction of 20th century uh, urbanism, is yet another aspect of how uh, spirituality could be bring, brought back into, into, into our cities. Sustainability, um, um, celebration uh, of, of nature and life uh, is very, very important to, to this cause. And this connection, not just to other human beings, but as to, 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 to life in general, is fundamental to, to connect it to this uh, invisible order of things. This is also, um, what this, this also uh, produces at time is this idea of idling. Idling as an act of fasting, as an act of, in a way, subversive act towards not consumption, not production. So we can actually enjoy being rather than um, doing or, or having. Uh, two examples here is uh, the high uh, uh, mile in, in New York and also the, the swinging um, seats in, in Philadelphia. 
very popular places where people go there and just enjoy themselves. Um, you, have, you have here the uh, Pompidou uh, and in, in Paris, the plaza outside, another place where people go there and uh, just do nothing. Very unproductive behavior, actually, but um, allows people to get to know each other, to generate community, and it's only in that act that empathy could actually grow and love and compassion can occur. We only love what we know. This, we know this from Plato uh, until now. So the more we know each other, the more we meet each other, urban love could generate. And I will close my example with this one uh, from New York City. This is uh, it's called the Oculus. Some of you may have seen it. Um, it's a transit station just outside the 9-11 uh, memorial. It's the closest to a, a, a secular cathedral you could see in New York. Uh, beautiful, angelical, celestial uh, space where thousands and thousands of people cross every day. Uh, in the bottom is a shopping mall, so not so much of a fasting. But what is intriguing about this, though, as you go there, and you see well, first people walk, but there is this, this incredible scale, this incredible silence because of the magnitude of the space, light that pours from, from above, the, the, the uh, verticality of it, and you see people just looking up and stopping and not consuming. In a way, it's, it's a stop of, of, of consumption. And I tell you, I've been there many times. It's just, it's just a, a spiritual experience. There is no question about it. And also, there is a, a level of uh, giving to the ordinary citizen a place of such beauty that it's impossible not to, see, to sense something other. There is a respect and a connection that begins to happen in the space. And I have another video quickly here uh, showing a pan on the other side. So you can see here that many things happen. There is a contemplative quality of the space. There is a reduction because of this uh, almost a mantric repetition of the structure that puts you in almost a, a, an alternative state of consciousness, and at the same time, the offering of connecting with uh, strangers. So if you think about human civilization, um, it's impossible to think without thinking of cities. City is what actually created the possibility of, of, of uh, human civilization. And if you think in the last 100 years, this hasn't been more true. So we owe a lot to our cities. But I think it's time for our cities now to give us something that hasn't done very well. And this is uh, allowing us to um, reconnect to something transcendental, to align ourselves with this invisible order of things. It's for architecture. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and we'll gladly come to you with a microphone. Hello, thank you so much for this very beautiful, informative presentation on, on the built environment. Um, but we left out some parts of Chicago that I'd like to include, because I think you have sure. a kindred, kindred spirit audience here. So we know the changes that our Chicago Riverwalk have recently made here in Chicago. Our beautiful yes. Millennium Park that has transpired all expectations. And here in Chicago, our Botanic Garden has a wonderful program, nationally known, on creating therapeutic landscapes which has, I've taken some of these classes, which have inspired me to see the beauty that is all around us. So we have so much here, but we also have a lot of development that seems to detract from a lot of this. So how do we, how do we make, how do we balance this in cities as like Chicago? Yeah, I, I was careful not to put anything from Chicago because I've been here many times, but I haven't been here for the last five years. I used to have a girlfriend here, so I used to come here quite a bit, a long time ago when I was in college. Um, so yes, I mean, even the Millennial Park is quite a remarkable place that invites people to come together and, and strangers to make friendship. So you're right. Um, I think the challenge is, is one of the challenges, often these beautiful places that I show tend to happen in downtowns. <laughs> 
you know, and so the cities are much larger and spread out. So how could, one question is how you bring this to the ordinary citizen beyond, let's say, the, 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 the highly packed, dense uh, areas, you know, like suburbia. Uh, how we, we could bring some of this, um, this, this, this uh, uh, new environments there. That's one question. And the other question, I think we have a conversation with Kim, is, um, I mean, I think what happened, some of the stuff had to also come from, I want to say central government because it's kind of anathema in America, but there has to be some sort of agreement, a communal agreement that uh, um, put less maybe power in the hands of developers and perhaps a little more power in the community. And I think that's, that's a big problem because, I mean, I, get, I hate to say, when, when, when money and, 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 and economic development is the only uh, measurement of success, some of these things we're talking about here is, is become second or third or fourth. And, and in that sense, the research that I showed today, which is, you know, many people are trying to do, try to provide facts or, or, or data to begin to show to developers and, other, and, and city officials and governmental officials that this is not theoretical, really have a real impact that could actually affect people's lives significantly. So I think we, it's, it's a multiple, multiple process I think needs to do. To continue this for a moment, in the field of therapeutic landscapes, the evidence, the evidence-based information is, has already been shown. So there's a reason why we smile when we see someone walking down the street carrying flowers. The reason why we want a view of the park, because yes. that makes us feel better. Our stress levels go down, our blood pressure goes down. So I see that you have, um, I don't want to use the word borrowed, but they both complement each other. Yes. Support each other. Yes, and for the longest time, actually, that's called attention restor restoration theory, the one you're talking about, by the, the, the Kaplans, the, the, the researchers. Uh, for the longest time, uh, that's what a lot of cognitive psychology and psychology went, is to look at the impact, particularly nature in cities. But uh, recently, there's more and more work, as I tried to show, and there's more that I didn't show, that uh, uh, demonstrate that our built environment architecture done well has some of the same effects as nature. Um, but I think we need to do both, of course. We need to do all this and more. Yes. Many of the wonderful examples that the first questioner had were either private money or heavily um, added to by private money. Millennium Park, for one, wasn't all private, but private had a lot to do with it, and are not-for-profits, uh, like the Botanic Garden, which is wonderful. We are a society, never more so than today, that tends to look at the bottom line and what is good for business. And some of the therapeutic environments uh, in hospitals, for example, have been, as my understanding is that they've been uh, put in place because they actually have an effect on the bottom line. People stay in the hospital, yes. require fewer days in the hospital when they look out on trees than when they look out on a blank wall. Mm -hmm. um, how do you persuade, aside from regulation, which also seems to be not too popular today, how, how do you, do you, is, is there, is there data or are there studies that suggest that this has uh, an effect on the economics, either individually for the developer or for the environment, the, the city itself, aside from the fact that people feel better and are happier mm -hmm. in this environment? So let me first say that um, most of the research happening right now in this area is funded by uh, the healthcare industry. Um, because exactly you're saying it's, a, it's in the bottom line that you show that a patient is healthier faster and, and so on. So there is there is growing body of evidence uh, supporting that. So I see that um, healthcare will be significantly improved by design and the built environment uh, is happening and it will continue to happen. If you go to the conferences, that's mostly where the data is is about. Uh, but the challenge I think is. Um, that there is very little, frankly, money to support the research. I mean, the research I conducted, I mean, it was ex basically it was donation, all of it. I mean, uh, so there is no funding for this kind of work. Um, 
not just economic, but just basic, basic research. Uh, this is highly problematic because, I mean, as I said, we are going to build as much or more that we have, the humanity have built in the entire history in this century from now until the end. Think about that. We're going to build more than we ever built. So you think that would make sense to spend a little bit of money researching the effect of these buildings, not just in terms of feeling good, but actually the other effects that you are mentioning, you know, where is any effect on the bottom line. And there is, no, there is no funding so far. And if you see the situation right now in terms of research in science, it's being cut. So um, I wish I had better news, but I, I, don't, see, I don't see happening. Uh, but all the research that we managed to do with the little support we have indicates that this is not an imaginary, imaginary thing. It's, it's, it's real. It's happening. And we all feel it. So it's not like we need... It's kind of, to me, frankly, kind of ridiculous that I had to prove something that I know by being a human being, I'll be an architect. I don't need to. But when you sit hand on hand with a developer as an architect, if I don't have concrete data, proof, I lose the argument, you see? So I think we need to empower the people that have some sense of insight uh, on how we could actually move forward in this more progressive agenda, I guess. Julio, I, I wondered, could you speak to the um, exterior of buildings? The examples that you gave were um, about the interior experiences on the whole. There was the one uh, view in Cadiz that was an exterior experience, but um, the interior experiences would have registered, that you showed, would have registered positively mm -hmm. in, for most human beings. Um, but the exteriors I found to be um, random and disruptive. And I'm wondering, you know, g given that buildings, um, exteriors and cityscapes mediate our experience um, between the exterior and the interior, what, what do we know about exteriors of buildings, cathedrals, you know, for, for example, or civic buildings um, in, in a traditional style. What, what do we mean in terms of the effect on, on human perception right. and, and, and response? Well, yeah. um, in terms of research, uh, we, don't know, we don't know very much. Um, I think we, I don't, I don't think of any neuroscience work done on, on in exactly where the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, definitely it's very hard to conduct uh, this research, you know, in, in, in urban environments too. Uh, I think with, so I, I don't have much, much to say about that. Uh, I could say, however, that certain qualities of the, of like symmetry and scale and materiality have a, a direct correlation to certain responses. Uh, but there is no more, I mean, it's no hard data on this. Next that question I know over here. My question is really about the education of architects in um, making plans for buildings that speak to our inner souls. Um, how do you get to that? Well, I, I, I want to believe that I teach my students to do that. Um, um, you know, what, what, what happened with most of the architecture education is, and I can understand why, is dedicated to teach people how to, to build objects. So, they, they, you know, we, we teach our students how to, to put this building, this, 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 this stuff together, so it, it creates this, this space. Uh, there is a lot less effort in architecture school to think of architecture as actually as a series of experiences, as a story. Um, the way I think of architecture is actually not designing building, but designing experiences. So we have an experience here because of how this building is, is these, these materials are deployed and, and held together. But most architects don't think like that. And so that's one of the dimensions of, that needs to change. And I think some depends each, each faculty, depends each school. This is called phenomenology in architecture. So it's a question of sensitivity. It's a question of, of sensing the environment and the environment actually um, talking to you. And I think this research helps, the research we are developing, the, the, the data we have. Thank you. You mentioned the problem is collecting data. What type of data can you collect 
that would justify the Oculus, given the criticism that's come that's come under. It's being too large. It's a singular person, uh, singular purpose. It's basically a commuter rail station, and the expense was tremendous. You know, the money could be spent on more pressing yes. social needs. Yeah, I mean, I, I was aware of the, the tremendous criticism because I think it's the most expensive building in history of New York, um, and it also it was not just uh, over budget; it was so it, it lasted too long. And, um, and I, I don't like the work of Santiago Calatrava, for the record, for the record. And um, so I went with a very bad attitude when I, I went there. Uh, very much like I went with a very bad attitude towards the Guggenheim in Bilbao, because I don't like the work of, of um, you know, that architect either. And, you know, and I, it's true, expensive. The money could have been spent elsewhere. I think every citizen that crosses that place will be impacted between now and the next hundred years. I felt when I went to New York is that it was the first building I saw in the last, since the, the, the Grand Station, that actually has the same attitude towards celebrating our community. You know, if you look at back when we built these great buildings, you know, the great infrastructure moment of America, you know, Union Station in, in Washington. This is just, maybe you have one here in, 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 in Chicago. These were moments in which people believe in something large, the common good. I mean, the common good costs money. I know how much we could debate that. Every person there were, is the wealthiest uh, citizen of New York, or the, 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 you know, the immigrant that is hiding from, the, <laughs> from being kicked out of this country. Everyone is a treated the same way in this place. And I think it's a beautiful place. And I, I can just speak as a human being. I was, I was moved. I was moved, literally moved to tears, seriously. Now, what is the cost of that? I mean, what is the cost of um, the Parthenon? You know what's the cost of the Parthenon? When the Greeks Build the Parthenon. I studied this, give a whole lecture on this in a, in a, in a conference. They spent what, uh, the cost of their entire fleet. It cost the entire fleet. That's why the Persians invaded them, right? They didn't have a fleet. It was a Mickey Mouse fleet, you know? <laughs> they put all the money in the Parthenon. If you think about it, I want to live in that civilization. Honor beauty. And somebody say, well, you know, they were slaves, you know, I mean, you know, the whole story. Yet until today, 2,500 years, if you go today with this dilapidated place, I don't know if you've been there. If you, if you haven't, I suggest you go. It's unbelievable. I mean, what is the cost of beauty? I will fight to the teeth. It costs, I will pay everything for it. Now, sure, there are people that need and so on. But what is the cost of war? I mean, how much money we spend on defense? And we don't have money for our own citizen for beauty? Hello? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, maybe it's ideological? I don't know. But I mean, I think, you know, it's like, well, we shouldn't send any spaceship to, 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 to Mars because there are so many, you know, problems on Earth. It's true, but, you know, we shouldn't spend trillions of dollars in, in defense. Maybe we should spend half of it. I'm not saying cut defense. So I mean, it's a question that we need to discuss. And, and, and I understand the criticism, and it's, it's fair. I mean, I, I understand it. And some part of me agree with it. But then the architect kicks in. And... I, uh, I have a question. Can you integrate what you're doing, or is it an either or? I mean, can, does this have to be kind of, and I apologize for this, but your way? Um, or can you take something that might be existing and integrate or fold some of what you're doing into their efforts, such as like we have a, a library that's coming in here. Is there a way to impact that that doesn't deviate completely from perhaps their original plan? No, I, 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 don't, I, I don't want, if I, if I brought the impression that it's my way or the highway, I, please, I, I withdraw, withdraw that. I, um, I think it's a dialogical process that needs to happen. 
Uh, and yet, as a great architect said, you know, try to find a good building that was designed through committee. It's a disaster, right? Great buildings never come designed by committee. Great art doesn't come by, you know, this is kind of politically correct, you know, it's kind of liberal, politically correct, which is very dangerous. I'm, I'm considering myself liberal for the record. But it's a very, very dangerous thing. The political, it's very dangerous. So, on one hand, we should have dialogue and, and all that, but at the same time, I think we should allow the people that are professionals to do their jobs. Um, and I think the community had to have a, a, a say, and, and you know, it's a complex project. You know, every, any, any project that is uh, run by citizens is a difficult project, but, but I think at one point you need to kind of, after all said done, and the research is there, and the data is there, needs to, need to let it happen. In terms of um, a building that has been already designed and it's gonna go up, as you suggest, maybe nothing could be done. Um, and I'm not saying it's gonna be bad. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of that particular case. Uh, but I mean, if, if you look again to the future, and many of us are gonna be dead within 30, 40 years, if we, if we are lucky, if we are lucky, live along. Um, but you know, as I tell my students, you know, what we're going to see in the next 50, 60 years is just mind-boggling. I think we need to really be uh, very conscious of, of, of how this massive transformation of Earth... I mean, think about two Chinas within 33 years. It's, like, it's, like, it's just crazy, two Chinas. It's like, you know, what, we are 300 million people? Like, eight times the United States in the next 30 years. Imagine eight times of the United States being built on this planet. And it can, you can build in the middle of the Sahara, so you're gonna be in certain locations. I think we need to have a serious conversation beside climate change, beside all this stuff, as about how we want to build. I mean, the resources we had to put there, the way we can affect people, because, you know, as I said, as I tried to argue, the way we live uh, are, is affected by how, this, this, this is the state of our lives. So I think we need to have a serious conversation, and I think we should try to help, help humanity to move more towards a more on a spiritual side of, of who we are, not just a practical side, but this larger um, understanding of, of who we are as, as, as being that has some, some soul, some divinity within ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.